What? Seconds. Uh, the whole hangout now is live. In three seconds? Yeah, yeah, we're live now. But the, the event isn't start yet. It should be started in 10 minutes or something. So we're still testing. In three what? Seconds. Uh, the whole hangout now is live. In three seconds? Yeah, yeah, we're live now. But the, the event isn't starting yet. It should be started in 10 minutes. So we're still In three what? Second. Uh, the whole hangout now is live. In three seconds? Yeah, yeah, we're live now. But <laughs> Sorry. Hello. So we're still uh, Hello? No. Yeah. Okay, we are online now. So if you want to go to live streaming, we are already online. Great. Okay. I will give you a list of the names from where? Okay. Hello. You should go offline. Go offline. So I guess he will be able to join when a city drops out. Okay, so the thing is that we're having five city participate now. Um, Morocco, please mute your mic. And and all close the live streaming uh, tab. And all close the live streaming uh, tab. <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> Sorry, Muhammad Dalal. From which country? 
Yeah, Noha, Noha, can you hear me, Habiba? Yes, Sahar. Yes. Okay, can you re remove Muhammad Dalal, please? Okay. Uh, uh, what, it, what, what time exactly when we start? When we will be starting? Okay, we're just waiting for Tom, uh, for for Tamer to join, and we start. Okay, so uh, in 10 minutes. Who's Muhammad Dalal? You, you, should, you should go offline, you should eject. You should leave the conversation. Please, Noha, let him leave the, eject him. Okay, uh, Sahar, shall I, shall I, shall I leave the, the conversation as well? No, 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 stay, just mute your microphone. Okay, okay fine, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yunus? Okay, uh, Raza, mute your microphone, please. Mm -hmm. Ludwan, uh, are you in the? You're not in the in the venue. Sahar, uh, I want yes. to eject you. So, um, okay, best one second. I want to make sure that Ridwan is a venue because we want to see the audience too. So, you want to be uh, uh, online for, for the whole hangout? No, 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 just one sec. Ridwan, okay. can you hear me? Khalas, I'll call him. You can eject me. It's fine. Donc, euh, il y aura un petit mot de, de Hala Fadel, chair, chair of MIT Arab Enterprise Arab Fan, euh, Fan Arab. Euh, après ça, il y aura, on va se connecter à travers les différentes villes arabes. Donc, les speakers de Silicon Valley, euh, de Silicon Valley, trois, trois speakers de la Silicon Valley, il y aura Ford, uh, Ford Tamer, CEO of, of uh, NP Corporation, Mike uh, Cassidy, Project Leader for Project Loon at Google X, uh, Oussama Hussain, uh, Chairman of uh, Teshwadi, uh, il est basé à Silicon Valley, et le uh, gagnant de, de la compétition de Business Model de l'année dernière, qui s'appelle euh, Istabak, c'est le nom de, du startup, il sera connecté de, de Bucard. Et finalement, il y aura un mot du, euh, du directeur de Hands, euh, Director of Strategies, euh, Alliances of the Skoll Foundation. Donc, euh, vous, allez, vous, allez, euh, vous allez un petit peu avoir un peu plus de détails sur les personnes qui vont, qui vont parler après le, le, après, après le, le début. OK. 
Casablanca, you need to mute your mic, please. So then you need to mute your mic, please. <laughs> Amid this Yemen, you need to come online in your time slot. I'm going to eject you now. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, Samer. actually she can, I actually, okay, okay, how did you? so, for time. Hi, Mr. Ford. This is Noha from Cairo. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, are, uh, are you familiar with the toolbox, the Hangout toolbox? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, can you please uh, make it um, appear uh, visible with your name on it? Oh, sure. Is that good? It takes a big space. Um, do, do, you want, do you need it or? Yes, this is perfect. Thanks a lot. It's taking a big space, though. No, no, it's it's perfect. Thanks That's a lot. That's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just mute your mic now. Okay. And and unmute it when uh, when it's time for you to speak. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
No, huh? Okay. Hi, Sahar, we're starting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mute your, all, please mute your mics. I think we're starting now. Is everybody hearing me? Yes? So we're starting. Good evening. Masal khair la li 23 Medina Arabiya muttasila bi ba'diha al ba'd. Good evening to 23 Arab cities connected to each other and to more than 2,000 entrepreneurs connected to Silicon Valley. This is the first time we uh, run such an event, so please bear with us in terms of patience with um, technology. We're trying. It's a very daring trial, and we're very happy to do it uh, to connect uh, to connect those 23 Arab cities. Uh, so we're very, very excited, and I encourage you to tweet this event use, using the hashtag uh, MITEFArabConnect because we want to trend it this evening across the Arab region and in Silicon Valley. Um, so just to give you a feel of what's going on, we're going to do a very short tour of five Arab cities that are with us this evening, uh, starting with the uh, beautiful uh, Dar al Baida Casablanca that is with us, and then moving to um, Muhammad in Gaza, and then again moving to Khartoum in Sudan that has uh, quite a good show up of people this evening and then to Cairo um, at AUC and finally to Jeddah uh, where we would be joining uh, Flat 6 Lab and Kutuf. Uh, so I'll let the Hangout people do the tour with uh, each city having an exciting sentence to say about entrepreneurship in their country and in their city and then uh, I'll take it from there. Okay, uh, do you hear me now? Sudan? Casablanca, it's your turn, please. Habiba. Good one. Good one. Oui, je commence. Yes, it's your turn to present your country, please. Your city. So it's your turn. 
to talk. Hello, hello, this is Casablanca. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can we, hear you. We can hear you. Yes, thank you, thank you. This is the cost of the live streaming. Uh, are, are, so, uh, are you familiar with the toolbox, the Hangout toolbox? Yes. Yes, I am. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, can you please uh, make it um, appear uh, visible with your name on it? Oh, sure. Hello, this is Casablanca, and we are really excited. Yes, yes, it's it's good. We can we can hear you. And it's a big space. Um, do, do you want, do you need it or? Yes, this is perfect. Yes, it's taking a big space, though. No, no, it's it's perfect. Thanks That's a lot. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just mute your mic now. Okay. And and unmute it when uh, when it's time for you to speak. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Hello, this is Casablanca, and we are really excited to be part of this uh, this important uh, competition, uh, business model, business plan competition in the Arab world. At, uh, and this is the first time we, we, we hold this event in Casablanca. And we are really happy to see such initiatives uh, coming from the Arab world to connect uh, with entrepreneurs, uh, create synergies, uh, and a vibrant uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem in the Arab countries. The ecosystem in Morocco uh, may be as similar to the others in the, uh, in the other uh, Arab countries, but it's, uh, it's not solid enough to give the backup needed uh, for Moroccan startups, uh, but fortunately, uh, support organizations are, uh, are growing, uh, building more incubators, accelerators, uh, seed investments, funds, uh, crowd, uh, uh, co-working spaces is essential to the ecosystem. And uh, uh, we have here uh, some some of the passionate and entrepreneurs in uh, Casablanca who are uh, uh, very happy to share uh, with uh, all the other countries, uh, all the Arab countries, uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, luncheon event of the uh, MIT Arab uh, 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 business plan competition. Thank you. Sudan, can you hear us now? Sudan, unmute your microphone, please. Unmute your yes, microphone. Can. Okay, can you can you uh, can you present yourself and send us the, your message? You can start. Ah. Uh, okay. Hello world, this is Khartoum Sudan. We are above the moon today for being part of this unique event among the 20 Arab cities in pursuit of entrepreneurship and prosperity. Here is our audience, we'll send you a big shout out. Can you copy us? Keep your phone next to you. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Cairo. Farah, are you with us? Cairo? Cairo? 
Cairo. Okay, Raza, can you hear me? Okay, Raza, please, it's your turn. Okay, can you unmute your uh, your microphone so we can hear you? You hear me now, right? Okay, perfect. Yes, hello, okay. world. Okay, Gaza, can you we hear me? From Gaza, and we would like to okay, tell Gaza, you our story. Okay, Gaza, it's your turn. Uh, Gaza News uh, and entrepreneurs are leading a revolution here for startups. Uh, this large number of attendees are telling you that they are here to win. And here is a cheer up from me. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to briefly tell you I'm back. Um, I'm just going to briefly tell you about the competition that we're launching today uh, with uh, two, three different tracks this year, an ideas track, a startup track, and a growth track. Uh, you can uh, get to know more about these three tracks on our website. Uh, but basically, the, the ideas track is, as it says, for an um, entrepreneur who come up with ideas and how to uh, bring them to market and prototype them. The startup track is for uh, startups who have already started and want to take their companies to the next level. And then uh, the uh, growth track, the global track, is for established startups that want to go global. And uh, these we are taking to uh, Silicon Valley, hopefully in April. So. Um, this uh, MIT Enterprise Forum Arab Business Plan competition that we're doing every year in partnership with Abdelatif Jamil Community Initiatives. And we're very proud to partner with Abdelatif Jamil Community Initiatives. Um, is going to take oh, about yeah. 30 entrepreneurs this year to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, where we have with us today uh, Ford Tamir, who is the um, CEO of Infi Corporation, but more than that, Ford has more than 25 years of experience in building technology startup, in particular in the semiconductor industry and in the uh, enterprise software field.
So uh, Ford is a serial entrepreneur, and um, he's uh, also uh, very well known for being a VP and general manager of Broadcom for many years. But I'll let him take it from there and tell you more about his experience. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I guess yes. It's great to be part of this launch event. I'm very honored to address this great group from Dubai, Egypt, KSA, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, Sudan, and Yemen, and I'm probably missing a few countries. You represent the hope of the region, as small businesses are the best engine for job creation. We have over a thousand people joining this hangout today, and it'd be great to see the businesses you represent turn into thousands of jobs for the region. <clears throat> I was fortunate to be part of a few successful startups and uh, growing a, a, a few large businesses, some to over a billion dollars. And I could brainstorm for hours on what's important for growing a business. Today, what I'd like to do for the next 10 minutes is focus on the culture for success. And I'll cover six L's that are important in my mind, and then open it up for Q&A. So number one, learn. Number two, leave your ego at the door. Number three, leapfrog and innovate. Number four, lead. Number five, leverage. And number six, love. So I'll go through all six and then uh, open it up for Q&A. So first L is learn. I started my journey at the American University in Beirut and was fortunate enough to earn a PhD from MIT. And I spent the first 10 years of my career in enterprise software and the next, 10, uh, the next 15 years in semiconductor industry, with three years in between working on renewable energy. So as a result, I had to constantly learn new technologies, new market, new products. To this day, my team and I do not stop learning. In order to succeed, you have to be constantly learning about every detail of the market you're in, your customers, your product, what it takes to bring a product to market, what it takes to finance it, what it takes to delight your customers and create a great user experience, how to win against your competition, and every aspect of the user experience and every aspect of, your, of the technology and business. If you stop learning, you become irrelevant. A culture of constant learning is essential. Embrace and request technical and business competence. Lead by example by learning yourself. Second L is a hard one. It says leave your ego at the door. This is not about you, and it took me a while to learn it. This is not about ownership or VC terms or money. This is about building a business, creating value, and making an impact. It's about the mission. Money follows success. Success does not follow money. So don't focus on ownership and control. You know, what I tell people is a small piece of a big business is better than a big piece of zero. Focus on your product, your customers, your market, and how to delight your customers. And the rest will follow. Also, building and growing a business depends on attracting and working with the best people in the industry. They'll be more talented than you are. So leaving your ego at the door is also about giving your team center stage and supporting them in the background. It's making sure they're well rewarded and taken care of. So the founder job is to support the team, not the other way around. Finally, leaving your ego at the door is also about being able to take rejections and failure. And I've gone through a lot of these through my career. You will, you know, especially in the early days, it's very hard to launch a business off the ground. And I've got a few scars myself. But failure leads to success if you remain incredibly persistent, driven, and tenacious, which I know quite a few of you are. The third L is leapfrog and innovate. 
Jim Collins, who wrote the book Built to Last, calls it BHAGs. It's not a PC term, but it's called BHAGs. It's basically big, hairy, audacious goals. So big goals. Set high expectations of yourself and embrace a culture of good is not good enough. My kids hate it because I tell them A minus or A is not good enough once you got an A plus. If you design a product to be 20% better than what's on the market today, the incumbent will beat you by the time you deliver. You should think you'll be in the market and compete two to three years from now. So set goals are 10 times better in big market and you'll have a chance to deliver world first product by the time you get to market. To get a culture of innovation, you need to embrace risk taking. Accept failures. Failures are okay. The key is to try many things. Fail early, fail fast, and weed out the bad ideas early. Don't have a big hierarchy. Keep the organization as flat as possible. Put rewards for new ideas, for patents. And keep yourself and your team very focused on your customer success and a great user experience with your product. What I also find is very key in innovation is to have an open communication. A lot of times, some of the bigger companies have a more regimented uh, 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 communication style. What Intel has this culture called constructive confrontation. And it doesn't mean you fight. It means that you allow open communication and debate around a product, around a business idea. And you keep the debate very focused on the problem at hand. Don't present it personally. Don't take it personally. So don't go tell somebody they're stupid because at some point somebody will come back and tell you the same. But it's totally fine in a big meeting to give feedback about the product, <clears throat> about the business. Remain respectful. And then once a decision is made, the second part of the culture should be debate and commit. So once the decision is made, every team member needs to get on board. And don't keep revisiting the idea and move on. So we've talked so far about the first three L's. Learn, leave your ego at the door, and leapfrog. Let me now talk about the next three, which is lead, leverage, and love. The fourth L is lead. And by leading, the first part of leading is executing. You've got to be a leader by being extremely clear on the vision, strategy, direction, priorities. You've got to lead in the market by delivering on your ideas and concepts. Many startups fail because they cannot deliver. They've got great concept, but these concepts say as a great, great concept. <clears throat> you have to get to market on time with quality products and services and delight your customers with a great user experience and technical support. Make sure to enable your team to lead. Create a leader-leader culture where every employee is empowered to lead. Most companies are organized as a leader-follower culture, with the manager being the leader and other employees following. <clears throat> that will not scale. That will not allow you to execute. You've got to have a leader-leader culture where every employee is a leader. It's hard to do and requires constant communication and free information flow. It requires empowerment, technical competence at every level, and accountability. <clears throat> if everyone is allowed to lead, execution will happen at all levels, and scaling and delivery will become easier. The fifth L is you're not alone. The fifth L is leverage. You have to leverage a partner ecosystem, a network, and your team. This is a team sport. It's not individual sport. You're not doing this on your own. If you are, it'd be too hard. In an individual sport like running, an athlete train, race, and win on their own. Growing a business requires creating a bigger team with your customers, your partners, your suppliers, your consultants, employees, investors, board members, other industry participants. 
in a team sport like soccer, there is a well understood and well communicated strategy, and everyone has to follow it. You can't have half the team play man on man defense and the other half play zone defense. Every player needs to be part of the strategy, has to have a role on the team, and by the way, stick to that role during the game. So if you're defense, you better stick to defense. Don't, don't go change in the middle between defense and offense. The next game, we may discuss how to change. But for the duration of that game, you better stick to, the, to, your, to your role. The best teams also do not just focus on winning a game. We all want to win a game. But they want to win the series and then want to go beyond that to build a really long-term winning franchise. That means winning series after series. This will require tremendous teamwork and constant collaboration between players, coaches, and owners. Finally, the six L is love. And you've got to love what you do and have some fun along the way. You're either passionate about this mission, or you should go find something else to work on. If you're coming to work in the morning and saying, I don't feel like going to work, you're in the wrong business. This journey will be 80 to 100 hour a week for a long time. And every team member should be extremely passionate and committed to the vision and the mission at hand. So in summary, we discussed learn, leave your ego at the door, leapfrog, lead, leverage, and love. So lastly, I'd like to make it a bit simpler and share a recent study from a Harvard Business Review about the three rules for success for growing a business. The study surveyed over 25,000 companies between 96 and 2010 and summarized only three simple rules on how to make a business truly exceptional. And I'm going to quote. One, better before cheaper. In other words, compete on differentiation other than price. Two, revenue before cost. That is, prioritize increasing revenue over reducing cost. And three, there are no other rules. So change anything you must to follow rules one and two. So pretty simple. Before I end my speech, I'd like to put a plug for a new IT initiative in Lebanon that will be launched soon. It's called Lebanon for Entrepreneurs. It's a joint initiative by three Lebanese diaspora organization, LIFE, which is the Lebanese International Finance Executives, LebNet, which is um, LebNet is a network of Lebanese American professionals working in the technology sector, mostly in Silicon Valley, and SEAL, which is a social economic action in Lebanon. And the goal is to assist in the formation and development of the next generation startups in Lebanon. The launch of it and more information will be coming soon. I conclude with this saying from Mahatma Gandhi, which in my mind embodies the life of a startup. And First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So keep it up, don't let up, and best of luck. Now we have a few minutes for Q&A. Hello? Yes, uh, we're going to take... Um one question maybe from the audience and then I'll switch to uh, Mike who's been uh, patiently waiting for us as we're a bit late. Um, so, um, well, yeah, we have here a question coming from, uh, coming from I think Raza, I can't see really uh, the location, but from the flag, I, I feel it's Raza. And um, uh, it, it is about so what you told us for this very inspirational. Uh, but then while they're, um, while they're fighting you and laughing at you and, and ignoring you, uh, like who should be your support? Who's your ally in this... Um, uh, in this um, long time sometimes where uh, you, you're unsure or you doubt about your success and the success of your business? 
I think you can get energy from multiple sources in this ecosystem. So you go back to what I was talking about, leverage. Um, you could get tremendous energy from your customers, uh, seeing them test your product, giving you some great feedback on your product. You can get, um, you know, great energy from your partners that um, would get excited about going to market with you. You can get great energy about your team and making sure that, you know, you celebrate every success and every product milestone or business win. Um, you know, take the time to celebrate the successes together as a team. Um, so you, 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 the energy will come from your ecosystem and, uh, you know, celebrate every success. And, uh, you know, for me, my best energy comes really from seeing the product works and make a big difference in the customer uh, user experience or customer life. Thank you very much, Ford. I thank you also for staying with us as we will have more questions for you at the end of this uh, of this call. Now I'll um, go directly to Mike. Uh, Mike, who's also Mike Cassidy from Google X, who's also joining us from Silicon Valley. Uh, Mike is also beyond the serial entrepreneur. And uh, now, um, at Google X, heading the Google X initiative, and he's going to tell us more about speed strategy. Mike, it's uh, your turn. Uh, good morning, salam alaikum. It is certainly my pleasure to be uh, invited to speak to this um, great uh, gathering. It's so exciting to have over 1,000 people as part of this. I have long been a big supporter of entrepreneurship uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I visited uh, several times um, for various entrepreneurial events. I want to thank Ford for an outstanding speech. <clears throat> I've never heard Ford speak before. That was excellent. I, I learned a lot from that myself. Um, I also uh, was an MIT student for my bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering. And I participated in the MIT 50K or 100K entrepreneurship competition. Uh, our team um, won that competition uh, actually twice, uh, in 1991 and 1998. Um, I thought today I would try to very quickly talk about uh, a philosophy that I really believe in, and that is using speed as a weapon for uh, startups. And I think the one excellent thing about this message for the, the, the assembly today well, is that anyone I, I use you don't have to have lots of money. You don't have to have lots of connections. Uh, anyone can use this um, sort of approach. And if we could go to the next slide, uh, why is speed important? I think for a number of reasons. It helps, um, makes it really tough for your competitors to gain traction against you. Uh, if it takes uh, two weeks, we, if we can release a product every two weeks and your competitors are releasing every 18 months, they will never catch up with you. That was true for my third project, Xfire. Um, and uh, it also builds a really strong team morale. Your team is very excited, uh, and they're happy to drive forward quickly. If you have certain metrics that move quickly, it's also great for getting great press about your company. Um, leads to more revenue, um, more strategic partnerships and hires. Having moving quickly makes the press want to cover you more. And finally, it's also of course, great for company valuations. When you're raising money or selling the company, the faster you're growing, the higher valuations you want to get. So uh, you can see from this slide a very fast way of approaching company. And I realize not everyone can do this uh, in uh, the middle, middle East. Things are different, but it's sort of aspirational. And the, the four companies I've done have all pretty much followed this. It takes a couple weeks of exploring ideas, Raising money in one day, I know that sounds very bold, but I will try to talk about a few ways you can try to stack the deck in your favor. Opening up your office in two weeks and building your product and launching in, in only three months. Um, and I think that's uh, sort of a great thing to sort of aspire to. Just very quickly, just fly through the next few slides. Uh, my first company um, was a computer telephony company linking telephones and databases. The interesting thing about this company is it did not require much capital. I started with $500, and each of my two partners put in $500. So we had $1,500. Within six months of launching the product, we were the largest 
uh, dominant player in the computer telephony toolkit market. Uh, the second company I started uh, was called Directed. It was a internet search engine, and one of the things people say a lot is, oh, all the ideas have been invented before, I don't know what to do. When we launched Direct Hit, there were already a number of search engines on the market, um, but we had a different twist. The other search engines based, were based on things like link popularity, how many links pointed to a site. We were based on clip, click popularity, how many people had clicked on a certain URL. And that was a very fast-growing company. That one reached a value of $500 million uh, 500 days after we launched it. And the third company was Xfire. Uh, it's an instant messenger um, that you could see what games your friends were playing, and you could click on your friend's name and be launched into the same game they were in. Uh, that, again, grew virally, and we'll talk about viral growth at some point. If you can get a product that grows virally, it's a wonderful thing. We went from 100 users to 3 million users in under two years, and MTV bought that company uh, for $100 million uh, two years after we launched the product. The, third, the fourth company was Ruba, and that's the one that um, Google bought, and that's why I'm at Google uh, now. Uh, so if we think about the things I want to quickly talk about today is the phases of doing a startup, fundraising, opening an office, hiring people, get new employees started, et cetera. Each one of these, I believe, um, we'll talk about how to do it very quickly, how to use speed as your weapon. For example, fundraising. I mentioned before this idea of um, raising money in a single day. Uh, and just briefly, each of the companies I uh, started didn't raise a lot of capital. Well, it depends on your perspective. But Stylus, that first one, was only $1,500 our own seed money and no venture capital money. Direct hit, the, the, start, the search engine that went on um, to be sold very quickly was only raised $1.3 in the first round, and Xfire raised uh, only $1 million. So how do you raise money quickly? Um, I, there's a couple things I recommend, and that is first raise when conditions are in your favor. Uh, at, obviously, that's obvious, but we do it a little bit differently. With direct hit, um, we actually raised our Series B just before we closed the deal with America Online and our Series C just before we closed the deal with Microsoft. And I approached investors and I said, we are about to close this big deal and our valuation is going to go up next week. So if you want to be in our, invest in the company, you should invest now before our valuation goes up. And that worked both times. Uh, the second thing I recommend is getting all the decision makers in the room. Sometimes it can be a long process uh, where you'll meet with one person in the investment in the venture firm, and then you come back and meet with another one and another one. I recommend for the very first meeting you say, we're very excited about working with you. This deal is moving very quickly, however. We'd like to have all the decision makers in the room for the very first time. That's sometimes hard to accomplish, but I think it's critical uh, to make things go quickly. The last thing is what I call bring an if-then contract into your meeting. So for the search engine company, as before we went to our meeting with our investors, we had spoken with a number of customers, and they had sent us an email which said, okay, yes, if you can build um, this search engine that has 50 millisecond response time, very fast response time, and 80% of the, their current users like the direct hit results better than the results they were showing, they agreed to say, yes, we'll pay for your results, $1 per 1,000 results, this was at a time they were selling the results for about $10 per thousand. And I brought these emails into my meeting with the investor. They weren't binding contracts, but it gave the investor confidence that we had a customer. Okay, so we talked about some ways to, to raise money quickly. How about opening an office? Uh, this is just sort of the tactics of moving quickly. We don't have to go through each one of these, but this is, again, for my second company, the search engine. In the space of just two weeks, if you follow the timeline, we pitched a venture firm called Draper Fisher Jurvetson at 8.15 in the morning on a Tuesday. By 4.30 the same afternoon, they'd given us a term sheet. And then if you look at the next steps, we flew back to our hometown of Boston. We got office space. We ordered our computers. We got the network software set up, incorporation. All these steps done in two weeks when we're ready to open the doors with our team ready. And I realized things 
can move faster in some areas of the world than others, but I think from an aspirational standpoint, this is the kind of speed uh, you want to try to hit. So hiring, I think, is another critical area. And I guess a little bit of audience participation, which we'll kind of maybe fly through, maybe a show of hands. We won't spend much time on the Hangout, but do you want to hire young, eager people who are ready to pull these all-nighters, ready to give it all, but maybe they don't have as much experience? Or do you want to hire people who you've worked with before um, and they're more experienced, but maybe they're not, maybe they're 10 years experience as software developers, but maybe they're not ready to pull the all-nighters? Um, we'll just sort of fast forward through. Um, I've had much better experience having a mixture of teams with some very sort of young, eager, uh, but inexperienced people. But I think it's important to have very experienced people, certainly for software development on the team. They know a lot of the, the techniques and the experience can help them move much faster. Um, and one other thing I think is critical when you bring these people on board is the process. What we do at all of my startup companies is we interview people all in one day. All the interviews they have will have take place over the course of the day. If the interviews are going well, Halfway through, I'll start calling independent reference checks. I don't take the list of names they give me as recommendations. I want to find an independent way. And before that person, the candidate, even leaves our office, if it's going well, we will sit down and say, great, we want to give you a job offer. Here is the offer letter. We will have written the offer letter up before they even showed up, figured everything out. If, if we decide not to give them an offer, we just turn it up, turn, tear it up. But if we decide to give them an offer, we're all ready to go. We say we're ready, ready to have you join. And are you? Do you accept? And oftentimes they'll say, "Wow, I wasn't expecting an offer right now." And we say, "Don't worry, um, sleep out overnight and let us know at nine o'clock tomorrow morning." This kind of speed gets people thinking, "Wow, this company is going to move fast." And also, you won't lose some of your candidates to other companies. Um, another thing is, what do you do when people are starting when they first arrive? Um, I think it's really a very bad thing if someone shows up and you don't have everything ready for them. If you say, well, your computer's not ready, sorry, your email account is not ready yet, sorry, that's terrible. When they walk in the door, you should have everything necessary, their email account, their computer, uh, any, if they're doing software, all the source, source code and source control necessary. And I sit down with new employees the first half hour they get there and talk through the project they're going to work on, what the deliverables will be what the expected timetable for finishing that project is. It really sets the tone for speed and for moving quickly. Um, OK, what about product development? This is another critical aspect for moving fast, another sort of thought question. Do we think it's better to build one module at a time um, and sort of incrementally roll it out, see how people like it, um, figure out what users want that way, or the opposite approach? Do we think it's critical to do a great job specking out the product? Do really good customer research. Make sure you hit the market with a great product the first time because people are not going to come back and try it again. Well, I found that actually the first approach works better for my companies where you build one um, sort of one module, one feature, and if you look at each of my companies, the, ver the very first um, the very first uh, uh, version of the product in each company was a very simple product. With the fir first company, Stylus, it only did two phone lines, and it was an interactive voice response system. Eventually, the products had 32 lines. It was digital. It had um, dozens of features, fax, and things like that. Same thing with, with uh, Xfire. The very first version, you just could click on your friend's name and join that game. Eventually, we had... Um, uh, file distribution, video capture, uh, in-game text chat. But the very first version was simple. And every two weeks uh, for that product, Xfire, we would roll out a new feature. And it, the great thing about that is um, we learned as we went along which features pe people really wanted. And if, you've gone, if you go the wrong direction, as Ford points out, fail fast. If you go the wrong direction, you quickly learn, oh, I should go a different direction. You haven't spent six months or 12 months building a product uh, that people won't like. Um, and in each case, these, this first version of the product was launched about three and a half months after the company settled, got set up and started in that direction. 
So in many ways, I, I encourage you not to sort of say, OK, here's the product we want to build. How long will it take before we launch? Instead, I encourage you to think, OK, we have three months or three and a half months. What can I build in three months? And just build that, that very simple version of the product, and launch it and get the feedback from users after that. OK, uh, one other area I think is very important to talk about is business development. So these deals you do with partners. And one of the things I have is that mm, the probability of any deal ever closing, ever, declines by 10% every day it doesn't close. That's a very sort of pessimistic viewpoint. But I found that to be, in my experience, very true. The deals I closed with Microsoft, it was, it was less than 10 days between when we started negotiations and we, we had a signed term sheet. The deals that stretch out longer, okay. those deals tend to never close, in my experience. And it, if you really believe this, it changes the way you negotiate. Um, so that if you're starting to slow down in the negotiation, I will say to the, the, the uh, person I'm negotiating with, this doesn't look like it's moving very fast. I don't think we're going to get to a resolution. Let's set a deadline of, say, tomorrow at 5 o'clock. If we don't have these things done, uh, we should just probably go our separate ways. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. So we need to have this by 5 o'clock. Now, many people will say, how can, you, how can you do that? How can you be so harsh with someone you're trying to negotiate with? You're going to lose the deal by being that aggressive. But I will say, in return, you're going to lose that deal anyway if you don't push hard enough. I think most people are really busy, and they can only have two or three or four things on their to-do list that they can really get done every day. And if you're not in that list of two or three things, you're, ne you're always going to be list number seven or number 12. So in order to be on that number two or three, you have to really push people. And this, is, this technique, I have had some deals that have not worked, but this, in general, this deal has, this approach has um, been very successful for me. Uh, OK, so uh, one last area of sort of marketing and public relations. Um, I believe that PR, getting coverage in, uh, on websites and news, is a much faster way to sort of ramp up quickly. Um, if you look at the sort of four companies I did, in many cases, we had no marketing budget at all. Instead, we relied on PR. And we were able to get on the cover of sort of the key magazines uh, of the industries. Uh, when we were in Computer Telephony, there was a magazine called Computer Telephony Magazine. We were on the cover of that magazine uh, twice in, in one year. And a lot of the ways you can do that is building a personal relationship with the editor of the magazine, sending them information that they find useful, uh, and helping them build their business too. Um, OK, so the last thing I want to talk about is really changing direction. And that is, I've given the impression, oh, it's so easy. You just move quickly. You roll out your product in three months. It's great. Well, I just want to be very open with you that um, three out of my four companies, we had the first version of our product completely failed. We had to completely change the direction of the company. Uh, and that was very scary and hard to do. Uh, the first company, we wanted to change the way everyone orders groceries. And we eventually turned into a tool for building computer telephony products. The third company, Xfire, we originally were this online arena to play in the tournaments and to win money playing tournaments. We eventually became a tool to find your friends online. Um, I think when you change directions is you're decisive about it. And so that you don't maybe spend 10% of the company, spend 20% of their time looking at new ideas. You immediately shift, and 100% of the company focuses on the new, um, the new idea. OK, so I've gone through very quickly. And I know even in my presentation, I focused on speed as a way of moving quickly. Uh, and some of these ideas, I think, um, may seem hard to do in the Middle East, where maybe things don't move the same pace as Silicon Valley. But I encourage it from an aspirational standpoint that if you can move faster than your competitors in whatever region you're in, you will have the advantage. And it's a very important advantage. And it's always worked, in my experience, to help the companies um, I've helped build to beat, beat out their competition and, and sort of reach uh, success in having great products that millions of people can enjoy, and also financial, uh, financial rewards for the investors and for the members of the team. So again, I'm very, very happy to be invited to speak today. I'm a huge supporter of entrepreneurship in the Middle East. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity. There are many entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley 
who actually look enviously at the Middle East and say, I would love to be starting a company there. It's a wide open space. There's a huge market, uh, 300 million people across the whole region, and I think it's an exciting place for you all to be starting your companies. Thank you very much. Mike, we have lots of questions to you and to Ford, actually, that are being uploaded now on Twitter. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Ayman Smile from the American University of Cairo Business School that is uh, here with us today and that wants to shoot at you the first question. Sure. Well, meanwhile, we, we had a question that is um, related to what you were saying actually just now. Um, like, can this speed also apply to the Middle East? And then how do you apply it uh, given the constraints of the region? So I think um, I have been there. I have, I've, been, uh, I've been to Egypt. I've been to Jordan. I've been to Dubai several times. Um, I understand that it's difficult. And in many cases where I have said one day it will be great if you can raise money in one month. Uh, however, if you can raise money in one month and your competitors take them six months, you will be ahead. Uh, if you can, instead of launching a product in three months, as I try to do in Silicon Valley, if you can launch it in six months, whereas your competitors are launching their product in one year, you will be ahead. One of the analogies that I love is the analogy of playing chess. If you can move your pieces twice for every time your opponent only moves once, you can even beat a grandmaster in chess. So you just need to be faster than your competitors. So it's relative speed. That's right. That's right. Great. So uh, is um, Cairo ready, Dr. Ayman? <laughs> So that that question, who's that a question for? For you, Mike. Is Cairo ready? Yes, I think Cairo is ready. Uh, I was just at an organization called uh, Endeavor, uh, which helps some startups in uh, developing countries. And there were some excellent uh, startups coming out of Cairo. Uh, one is a medical uh, company, and I think there's um, a lot of... <laughs> Uh, people, obviously, in Cairo, there's a big market, and a lot of people are looking for higher quality solutions. So it's a tumultuous time, but sometimes tumultuous times are times of opportunities. When I look for uh, areas to go into, I look for areas that are unsettled uh, from a technology standpoint, but it can also apply from an infrastructure standpoint. When things are settled and everything is stable, it's harder for a new <laughs> firm. When things are changing, there's opportunity. Okay, we, we have a question from Qatar that says, uh, you know, what about long-term ventures and ideas that don't fade? Um, you know, how does speed apply to them? Uh, I think that speed helps the company get off the ground and grow quickly, but I think it's also important for a long-lasting uh, product to continually innovate and continually bring in new features. If your product is designed to last, is expected to last 10 or 20 years, but you stop innovating or stop moving quickly, then you will be uh, defeated by uh, newcomers who can move quickly. So I think it's just as important for companies that want to have a product that lasts 5 or 10 or 15 years to come out with new products. I mean, look at, uh, look at the variety of companies that have been successful over the long duration. Uh, almost all of them have continually added new products and new features to their product lines. Uh, we have a question here for both Mike and Ford. Uh, a, a very successful entrepreneur here from uh, Beirut, Hindah Bay'a who wanted to, um, to ask how do you balance uh, your strategy between a world-class product 
and a minimum viable product um, in light of speed and just in general because it's coming from the region. Ford, why don't Ford take you this one? Uh, I think you should start, Mike, maybe. Okay. And um, well, I, I think sometimes people think, well, if you move so quickly, the product won't be very high quality because you're cutting corners and you're, you're, you're too sloppy or something like that. Um, I think the opposite is true. I think that by the ability to quickly adjust and adapt your product and roll out a new version of it every two weeks, maybe the first version or the second version or the third version will be not the most beautiful product or will be not the most fully featured rich product. But if you pick any point down the road, three months down the road or six months down the road, that approach of adding a new feature every two weeks and quickly and starting off maybe with the not fullest feature will, I believe, really get you to the highest quality product because you will, by definition, be listening to the market about the features they want, which is, I think, the definition of the best product. And you will be adjusting your product quickly, getting to the place you want to be as opposed to taking one year or two years to to build what you think is a great product. One of the biggest risks I think happens is what you think is a great product, when you finally get it to market, you find out that your target market doesn't agree with you. All the features you think are great, they don't think are great. So I think the best way to make the highest quali quality product is actually to move quickly also. And uh, then we had, I, I don't know, is Ford here? Do you want to give a shot to the answer? OK, otherwise, the um, a follow-up question on this, uh, how do you adapt this strategy to hardware where um, in, yeah, capital required for hardware is probably higher uh, than uh, online businesses or software? So if, if you have a... Um, a fast strategy and it fails, then you need to invest again a, quite a big amount of money to uh, to relaunch a product. No, I agree. Um, I think it is harder um, to move at sort of the very rapid pace with hardware products. Um, at the same time, I encourage people to think about ways to make it possible to move faster with hardware products. For example, um, firmware upgrades. If you can design your product from the beginning so that your firmware can be up, upgraded you know, anytime you, the, the maker, wants and have the, hard, the physical part of your product designed so that as you add new software features to the firmware, that physical product can incorporate it. For example, having soft buttons, meaning buttons that are labeled by the firmware, not hard buttons on the product. Uh, that way, as you upgrade the firmware, your physical product can be upgraded with your new features. And I have seen uh, companies take advantage of this, some in the Silicon Valley, and they have been successful with it. Uh, then I have a question here from uh, a, a UAE-based startup, Nubbish, uh, about how do, you, um, how do you adapt your pace, or how do partners or suppliers adapt to your pace? How do you have them adapt to your pace? Yep. Um, it requires a close partnership uh, with uh, partners, and it requires close information flow. Um, there are many techniques you can label, such as uh, Google Docs. I'm not trying to plug Google, but Google Docs or things where you're looking at the same information that your partner is looking at. So um, as you update things internally, your partner can see, oh, it's the sort of standard we need faster inventory, or even as you do your quality um, inspections of the products, they can see real time what you're finding in the products that you like and don't like. Um, and I think that information flow uh, to the right people inside the supplier can help them um, adjust their products quickly. The, the key is uh, getting the goals aligned. So they want, as you grow, they want to grow too, and they want um, the more of your of the supplies that you order from them, the happier they are, and to make sure that they are having a good deal, it's a good deal for them too, so they make money. I don't try, when I negotiate with people, I don't try to win the negotiation. 
so that the suppliers are kind of ambivalent about proceeding. They're not making enough money. I try to have them set up so that they too are profiting and are excited about uh, the growth of, of my businesses. Yeah, so I had uh, another question here, Mike, to you, and then we'll release you. Thank you for your uh, uh, time. Is uh, from Salim Sada from uh, Dubai, also from the UAE, saying, what do you mean by PR is better than marketing? Um, even with online marketing, uh, you would think that's sort of very quick, certainly compared to offline marketing. Offline marketing, traditionally, print marketing is quite slow. It's probably 10 weeks <laughs> between when you start working on, for example, a, um, an advertisement for print and you design it, you create it, you send it to the publication probably eight weeks before it's actually printed and on available in newsstands and things like that. So it's a 10 week process. But even with online marketing, uh, it's a process of creating ads, um, uh, placing them with a with a uh, with a venue that will be showing them, whereas PR tends to be, in my experience, a much bigger hit, much faster. If you can be, you know, on the cover of some of these magazines I talked about, hundreds of thousands of people will see them, be exposed to your product. Um, if you can get a good, you know, news story or viral story, it'll quickly spread. Um, especially if if people share that news story with their friends. Um, so, uh, just from the raw numbers of how many people you can reach with sort of effective PR versus uh, targeted marketing, uh, in my experience it's been faster and a larger audience to go with uh, sort of a PR approach. So, thank you very much again for having me, Shukran, and uh, I wish all of you uh, good luck with your businesses, and um, I hope to again travel to the Middle East and, and meet, with, meet with some of you in the coming year. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Okay. Um, actually, Ford and Mike are MIT alums, so we're very proud of that. There's a big MIT community gathering uh, this evening at the American University of Kuwait. Uh, thank you to the American University of Kuwait for being with us. Uh, and now I'm going to move again to another place in Silicon Valley where the winner of the MIT Arab Startup Competition last year, Instabug, uh, made it all the way there, and we have some great updates about their latest development uh, with uh, Osama Hassanain uh, being, ma, uh, being with uh, Muatez Suleiman over there and Omar Gob from Cairo that will be joining to update you on their latest development. Instabug, the winner of the uh, MIT Enterprise Forum Arab Startup Competition. Asa, Masa al Khair, and Asa and Tasilukum Kubuleti. So it's been a privilege in the last three years to play a mentorship role remotely from Silicon Valley to help finalists from the MIT Arab Startup Competition realize their dreams of building successful companies, whether it's uh, Sharif Greatly of Talk Clouds or Hassan Mahgoub of Al Khawarizmi, who won first and second place in 2011. And Hint Hubeka, who's actually with us today, and Perihana Buzaid, who also won first and second plus, uh, place in 2012. And most recently, Omar Gabra Matas Suleiman of Instabag, who won the 2013 competition. Well, Omar and Matas have been with us actually for about three months now, and uh, uh, they will share with you their experience post winning the competition and their perspective on what, what lies ahead. So, uh, Mohtaz is here. He's just going to uh, say hello. And then Omar is in Cairo and he will share the story with you. Okay, Omar, your turn. Thank you. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Omar Gavr. I'm the co-founder of Instabug, and we, as, as uh, Dr. Sam mentioned, we are the winners of last year's competition. 
Uh, I'm calling you from Egypt, specifically from Flat Six Labs, the place where it all started. So as a start, I'd like to thank uh, you for giving us the chance to, to talk with this wonderful speakers and to celebrate the launch of the seventh MIT Arab Startup Competition. Uh, I would like to share the experience of with Instabook from the moment of winning the competition back in April till now. Actually, it has been uh, a really amazing experience from the moment of starting the company since Motez, my superstar co-founder, and we decided to start this company back in June last year. Uh, for the competition itself, I, I truly believe that the, the whole competition were designed for us. Uh, the timing of competition was, was perfectly aligned with the launch and release of our private beta, so it was perfect for in terms of exposure and user acquisition. Uh, on the other side, the, the 50K, 50,000 was simply phenomenal. Uh, what could be better in the world than leaving your office for five days and then coming back with $50,000? So it was perfect. Uh, I could spend the whole day talking about the competition and every aspect and how it was crucial and beneficial for Instabug. But let me share you with you what's next. What we did after the competition itself. The amount of energy that we got from the competition was really huge. It kept pushing us for three months, from April to July, working on the product itself, listening to our users, building a better product and a more powerful company. Actually, we got our focus and energy back after putting our financial problems aside. So uh, we were chosen among the top five innovation startups in the mobile feed to pitch at Mobile Beat, which is the annual event of Venture Beat, which is one of the most powerful events in the Silicon Valley that happens uh, once a year. Uh, and we did that, and we launched our public beta over there. And since then, uh, things were going more than perfect. We're in the Silicon Valley since July for the past three months. I just got back last week, and Mortez is, uh, is over there. In this period, we have been presenting in all the big events, uh, TechCrunch, the next web, plug and play, you name it. And we have been winning many competitions over there. We had one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Square, Evernote, Dropbox, and many, many huge companies. And their feedback about the simplicity of the product was, was simply unbelievable. On the product side, we have been developing uh, on the feedback that we got. We have been expanding to more mobile platforms and adding more features to make a better product. Uh, we've, we're growing our team here in, e in, in Egypt and back in, in, uh, in the US. Actually, we doubled the size of the team in the past two months. For the investment and the investors, we pitched to almost uh, 100 investors. Uh, and we're closing the round right now from local Silicon Valley VCs and angels. And most importantly, we have been increasing our user base for the past, in the past three months by six times. So our user base expanded six times. And we reached a staggering amount of 200,000 users reporting bugs through Instable. So for the past three months, we've been working closely with the Tech Ready team as part of the program of the winners for the MIT, which it's a great additional price to the 50K itself. The whole team over there helped us greatly uh, to make everything smooth, to help us on focusing on the product and building a better company. So uh, that was a quick insight about what happened uh, with Instabook from the moment of winning the competition till now. We believe that this is just a start for more and more success to come. So stay tuned to our updates, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. For the uh, for the update, Omar. Um, so we had uh, actually a question from Tunis uh, that um, was asking about social entrepreneurship and if social enterprises could participate in the MIT Enterprise Forum Arab Startup Competition. And the answer is yes. We have a social entrepreneurship prize this year. Um, that will go into the normal track. It's just a different price. And I'm very happy, actually, this is a nice transition into um, Sandy Hertz from um, the Skoll Foundation, um, the head of strategic partnership for Skoll, uh, that is here with us. And uh, it's a nice transition into social entrepreneurship. Sandy, it is your turn. 
Great, thank you so much, Hala. Um, this is it's uh, a great pleasure for me to get to speak to all of you and to be part of the MIT Enterprise Forum Arab Startup Competition. At the Skoll Foundation, we believe there's tremendous opportunity uh, in the whole MENA region for entrepreneurship, both uh, at an economic and um, uh, social level. So there's so much uh, to be done, and I think the people on this call are the perfect people to do it. Uh, Osama asked me to speak today a little bit about my story. Um, so my background was that I started off as an investment banker and I often refer to myself as a recovering investment banker. I was in the bonfire of the vanities uh, time on Wall Street when there were a lot of leverage buyouts and restructurings and um, meanwhile the civil society of New York seemed to be falling apart around me. So I was uh, stepping over homeless people going to and from the office. My doorman was shot in, while I was in my building, and yet I was doing deals of one billion dollar company acquiring another billion dollar company, um, and the deals were on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, and to me it felt like I was rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, that I wouldn't be able to tell my grandchildren that I'd really had a, an important or meaningful life even if I did these really important deals if their experience of the world was one of instability and insecurity and uh, not being able to have the life that they wanted. So I went back to graduate school, I went to business school specifically to focus on uh, social change and trying to make a, a difference in the world through primarily nonprofit organizations. And I spent some time learning how nonprofit organizations work. I got a degree in education at the same time as I got my MBA. But if there's one thing that I found, it's that nothing ever happened the way I thought it was going to happen. I thought I was going to work with children, and instead I worked with people with disabilities. I thought I was going to um, make a difference in the straight nonprofit world. But in the end, I took over a technology center, uh, something now called the Silicon Valley Forum, uh, at the time called the Center for Software Development, which was this tiny nonprofit that was supposed to be an interoperability lab for technology entrepreneurs. And uh, it seemed to me that while this little organization was likely to, or was about to fail, or appeared to be about to fail, it shouldn't have been that there was in Silicon Valley and I think in the MENA region as well a real interest and in coming together between venture capitalists, between technology companies, between entrepreneurs um, that ought to create a more vibrant uh, ecosystem. And so I took this over and built it up from having less than a hundred technology entrepreneurs and members to having more than two thousand and having now 40 different venture capital firms that were part of it and all the big technology companies of the time, Apple and Microsoft and Oracle and Sun and so on. So a different set of players than it is today, but the big players of that time. Um, and created essentially a, a center where entrepreneurs could meet to talk about what new technologies were developing, but also to learn marketing, to learn finance, to learn operations, to get a mini MBA and all the things they needed to know in order to get a successful startup off the ground. And we had showcases where the most successful entrepreneurs could uh, show off to the whole Silicon Valley community what new ideas they were developing. Um, and it became a really vibrant center. It was about uh, 20 to 30 different events every month. And uh, it, was, it was an exciting place to be. But then, of course, life continued to change. And I um, took some time off with my kids um, because uh, they needed my attention more at that moment in time. And um, thought that was going to be it for me for a while. My husband is a technology entrepreneur. I think his profile probably fits the profile of many of you on this, uh, on this call. And so I was going to let him be the one to kind of lead the charge and I would stay home. And um, then I found out there was an opportunity with the Skoll Foundation. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Skoll Foundation uh, was founded by Jeff Skoll, who's the uh, founding president of eBay and focuses on social entrepreneurs. So people who have big innovations that have transformative potential against the big issues of our time. And my, my role uh, 
has been to focus on not just how to give them money so that they can, see, can succeed, but also to think about what more we can do around that, how to connect and celebrate them in particular. So who are the people they need to know to be successful? In government, in the corporate sector, um, in academia, in the funding world, everywhere, who do they know? Who's the ecosystem, the, community, the global community of innovators they need to know to be successful? And how do we connect them? And then how do we tell their stories and enable them to tell their stories so that they can be successful? And um, I started off uh, as uh, the head of marketing, which was sort of everything except the investing. But over the course of time, really have specialized on the storytelling side of our work. And the reason that that I think is interesting here is that I've come as a recovering investment banker and very much a left brain kind of analytical person to have a true appreciation for the power of stories and how we as human beings are wired for stories. That we learn from stories better than we learn sometimes from statistics and from uh, white papers and uh, official documents. If you can tell someone a story that really moves them about how their life is going to be different as a result of using your product and service, if you can tell them a story about how your product is going to be transformative to the lives of other people, you can make a really significant advance in your work and in your market than you could otherwise make. So I'll tell you the story of Amitabh Sadangi, who runs an organization called ID India. And Amitabh has developed a spectrum of irrigation products for uh, farmers, subsistence level farmers in uh, rural India. And with those products, farmers who otherwise would have to migrate uh, in the dry season, who are barely able to make uh, a subsistence living and keep their families going, who have lived in poverty for generations, are able to afford for just one dollar a very basic irrigation product that enables them to grow enough produce to be able to sell some and be able to afford the next product and grow enough from that to be able to afford the next product and essentially creates a ladder out of poverty for now one million farmers who have generated more than a billion dollars in wealth. But even more interesting than that is that he recognized the power of storytelling to not just attract investors to his business, but also to move the farmers to believe that their lives could be different. Because if you've lived in poverty for generations, if you live in a caste system, you have no reason to believe that somebody can sell you anything that's going to be able to change that. And so he started to make Bollywood-style films and short documentaries that showed his customers how his life was going, their lives were going to be different. And by doing that, he credits that strategy and being able to take these films out into villages with, big, with a big van, with a screen on the side, and do village-level screenings. That was the strategy that really helped him scale and get adoption from his customers. So I hope that you will take away from this story not just that there are lots of twists and turns and that um, things never turn out the way you think they're going to, but if you keep adapting and and moving forward, uh, you can get to where you want to get to, and that storytelling is an important part to remember, not just the analytics, not just the engineering, but how do you tell the story and how do you move people to be excited about your product and to buy it, invest in it, and be a part of it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the future. Thank you so much, Sandy, for bringing a human side to our entrepreneurship story uh, or stories. Um, we have tons of questions, and I know that um, Ford has been uh, bearing with us for a long time, so I'm going to uh, uh, direct, uh, first of all, a question from Doha, Qatar, and the um, uh, Qatar Incubator and Bidaya. Thank you for being partners of this. We have a question, Ford, what makes an entrepreneur Concentrate on building value. Makes an entrepreneur concentrate on building value. Yeah, I think what oh. the person meant here is uh, where do you get the focus and the drive to uh, always add value to your customers? Well, I think you know one of the interesting things in my career is that I worked both straight technology entrepreneurs and with social entrepreneurs. 
So social entrepreneurs sometimes have technology, sometimes don't. But what they both have absolutely in common is this continuous need for improvement, for value creation, for moving forward the, um, the product and the experience. And it's, um, I think, inherent to the nature of an entrepreneur uh, never to sit back, never to feel it's good enough, and always be looking for what more can be done. Uh, that, that drive... That, that drive and that initiative is, is critical. So I, I, I don't know what it is that makes them do it, but I think you're not an entrepreneur unless you have it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Ford. Um, uh, Ford, you, your take on this? What's the drive? Sometimes the drive is a necessity, you know, when you, uh, uh, you know, going uh, from uh, paycheck to paycheck, as I said, my early days, uh, our, our view of good food was uh, trying to uh, uh, buy a drink at happy hour to get access to the snacks around that. So, I mean, you, you've got a lot of urgency to go somewhere, and, uh, you know, you, 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 keep, you keep going. You've got to be passionate about what you do, but I think you get a tremendous energy from customers. And so, uh, you know, for us it was, you know, testing the product, getting some feedback, you know, and then going back and doing some more of it, and you only have a certain amount of money uh, that that you've got, and that's not a lot of money. And you know that you've got to get something accomplished before the money runs out. So uh, I think it's a combination of necessity and um, and customer feedback, customer in intimacy. Uh, the partners also help a lot. So if you've got some partners that are very supportive of you, uh, their enthusiasm and energy feeds uh, feeds you. Uh, another question we have from um, uh, Raza, Basim Abu Dhaka, who asked both Ford and uh, Usama Hassanain, um, when do we need to move our team to Silicon Valley? When is the, when is the right time to do that? Usama, go ahead. Why don't you start, Ford, because I, I'm not sure Osama is still connected. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I, I would think that um, it'd be best to try and get some um, local traction in, in the region first and get, you know, the product somewhat off the ground to a stage where you've got some customers in a product and then um, you know, presence here would be needed. Uh, to access a broader market and access a broader base of investors. But I would think, uh, I'm not the expert in, uh, in, in that transition, uh, but I would think that uh, you, you'd, you'd be better off getting some initial traction, having some form of product and some form of early financing before you, you make the move. Okay, great. Thank you, Ford. And we have another question from Qatar about how would engineering uh, and uh, benefit from uh, from an engineering sorry an engineering startup benefit from online marketing, like a physical product or um, a hardware benefit from online marketing. I'm not exactly sure I understand. Uh, you, are, is the question... question, 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 question. Is, is how would engineering benefit yeah, how, from... How uh, would um, a, uh, maybe a hardware startup uh, maybe grow faster by uh, benefiting from um, online marketing and online outreach? Um, I think, you know, every company can benefit from online marketing. Um, I'm not exactly sure about the question, Hannah. Yeah, um, it's um, because of the Twitter restrictions, I think that the questions are not very, uh, very clear. But there is a, a point here about, you know, there are so many people marketing online today. So, um, for uh, for uh, something that's not necessarily online, like an offline-based solution, um, 
it's it's difficult to find the right path to uh, to do proper marketing. So um, I think they're trying to connect to your um, semiconductor background and see how um, how online marketing has changed maybe the way you communicate about your product. I mean, it's all the usual suspects. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the one thing for us that has been uh, a big, a, a big change has been obviously uh, recruiting for us works online very well. So we use LinkedIn as a, as a very much of a recruiting tool. Uh, we uh, we're slightly different in the sense that we know who our customers are. So we we're not uh, um, trying to prospect online, but we we definitely you know advertise online and promote online. Um, you know, I, I, I would think uh, you, you'd benefit uh, you'd benefit the same way uh, everybody else does. I mean, we're we're not uh, um, we're not we're not different here than than other startups. Um, okay, thank you. Um, maybe uh, another question here about mentorship. If you if you have used mentorship in your life, and if so, what kind of profile? And would you recommend uh, mentors? And if so, how many? Yeah, I would highly recommend mentors. I've, I've used them throughout my career. Uh, I'm actually using mentors now more than I used to use mentors in my early career. And uh, I think the issue when we're younger, we we sometimes hear, but do not take the feedback. And I wish um, I was smarter when I was younger. And Taken the feedback from some of these mentors, so uh, I think mentorship is extremely important, and uh, be great to surround yourself with people that have experienced already the same issues that you'd be experiencing. It would uh, avoid making a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, right now you don't know what you don't know, and uh, there's this analogy in sport. It's almost like a circle. If you start in any sport, you are unconsciously incompetent. So you're incompetent, but you don't know it. And then after a while, you become unconsciously competent. Means you become competent. Uh, I'm sorry, you become uh, consciously incompetent. You're still probably not as good, but at least you're aware of it. Then you then you then you become consciously competent. So you're you're working hard at being competent, and you're competent because you're working hard at it. And it goes back to being unconsciously unconsciously competent. So people like. Tiger Woods, they are so good at golf, could hit a golf swing and, and, and not think about it twice. If you're not careful, you can go back from unconsciously competent to becoming unconsciously incompetent. So you, you've got to, throughout your career, keep training, keep listening to advice. Mentorship is phenomenal. The key, though, is listening and, and hearing the advice and acting on it as opposed to just hearing it but doing something else. So I think it's important mentors are phenomenal. Just make sure that you know. Try try and take the advice into consideration and do something about it. Um, I can see here on my screen a very good line not from uh, 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 Abu Dhabi. Um, I would like to thank them for being here and um, listening to MIT. Who are here with us. So, big salute to Master and thank you for being with us. Big salute also to Yemen and uh, Oran from Algeria. Um, we also have um, people from uh, Kuwait, from uh, Ramallah, from Skandaria in Egypt. So, um, Lots of connections here. Uh, I would like to say that the MIT Enterprise Forum Arab Business Plan competition is now open for applications, and that we have three separate tracks this year: the Ideas track, the Startup tracks, and the Global track. And the Global track will take place in Silicon Valley. You can check for the criteria for these tracks online. And um, thank you for your patience and bearing with us for this first trial. But I think we've done um, a good job um, for a first trial, and we keep on improving as we go to connect more cities, more speakers, and maybe in a more uh, efficient way.
in partnership with Abdul Latif and Jamil Community Initiative. So a big thank you to them as well. And um, uh, we hope to connect with you soon. Um, and um, I, I'm just reminded here to thank also the Mediterranean School of Business in Tunis that has been quite active today on Twitter. So thank you. Thank you very much. And let's connect with you all soon through another uh, MIT event.